This is the last lecture for the class. Um, so this lecture is a bit more, uh, I don't want to say abstract, but it's sort of me just dumping a lot of information on you guys uh, about new hardware. Um, and the idea here is that uh, if you're building a system from scratch today, you may not actually want to use any, anything what I'm talking about here, but this is like going forward, maybe in a year from now, depending on some of these things, this is, uh, this is something you, you may want to explore, right? So uh, from administrative things real quick, uh, as a reminder, on, on Wednesday, there's three things happening. We have our, our guests from Snowflake will be giving a, a guest lecture about their database system uh, in class. I'll be also handing out the final exam. Um, the final exam will be due on the day of the final presentation, it's May 14th, so you have basically 12 days to do it. Um, and then also at midnight, you'll have to do your second code review. Um, so the way you should do this is um, you should do an, uh, just do an update to the, your pull request on uh, GitHub. You can close the other one if you want, but I, ideally I want to have all the comments in there. Um, actually, it might make sense to actually do a new one because that way, yeah, actually post a new one and that way I, I can see, you can see the old ones and see the new ones. Yes? Didn't you say you're going to push it back to fourth? Yes. Yeah, correct. Yes. Ignore this. The fourth. Yes. Thank you. Um, whatever it says on the website, the website, yes, ignore this, website real, okay. And then the final presentations will be on May 14th. So another one is, I looked it up, the room sucks, it's in the other building. Uh, as far as I can tell, no one's using this room at 8.30 in the morning on that Monday. So let's just use that, right? Because I know the, the you know, in Doherty Hall, it's like a, you know, the huge room we used to teach the intro database class in. And I'd rather, this is a bit more intimate, so I'd rather do this, all right? Is that a problem for anyone? I don't think so, right? So same time, just didn't hear, and I'll send a reminder out to everyone when, when we get closer to this, okay? All right, and then the other major thing is that uh, you've all should have gotten emails from the university about faculty course evaluations. So I, I actually do read these carefully. And I actually try to help or try to fix things in the course from year to year. So please, 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 I'll remind you multiple times, please actually fill this out. I don't care if you badmouth me. Uh, you can say whatever you want, um, and I actually will take into consideration and try to make the course better. Um, so last year, I won't, I won't say names, last year there was somebody who was dating someone who's taking the course now, and apparently they had a bad breakup near the end of the semester, and they knew the other person was taking this class. So they said you sh Andy should give midterms in the class, and that's why you all had a midterm plus the final, right? <laughs> Another one that was actually super useful is this person here told me how terrible I smelled, and frankly, he was right, right? I had this weird, bad body odor problem, uh, and as far as I can tell, since I've started showering every day, this is no longer an issue. So again, if you guys provide me useful feedback and the faculty course evaluations, I will actually uh, try to rectify things and fix things, okay? All right, any questions about that? What's that? Because I'm teaching the class, don't write about, don't write your evaluation for Joy, he's not here, right? Write about me, all right? Apparently, the department also reads these too, right? All right, so today's class, as I said in the beginning, it's, it's really about exploring what other types of hardware that's out there can we apply to our database system. So we've been focusing on sort of a classic von Neumann architecture of you have a CPU, and the CPU has, has caches, and then there's, and there's main memory, and then your program you know, that you load into the address space. Um, so we want to look to see whether there's new hardware that's available to us that may not fit this exact model that we could use to, to, to accelerate and speed up our database system. So this is not a new idea by any means, although the hardware is new. Uh, people have been thinking about this for a long, long time. So going back in the late 1970s, early 1980s, there was this sort of class of database systems called database machines. And sort of think of these as specialized hardware that was custom to running an actual database system. So this could be things like uh, computational accelerators to do hash joins very efficiently, or uh, custom hardware that would be embedded in the storage devices, so you can do predicate push down, instead of actually having to, you know, as you stream the data off the disk and bring it to CPU, you could apply your filter right then and there to reduce the amount of data you had to look at. Look like, look at. Um, 
But these sort of fell through and didn't actually uh, uh, didn't actually come come very prominent just because the hardware was always getting better uh, so quickly. So like commodity hardware. So by the time you actually fabbed out a database machine, you know, Intel had a new release or, or IBM had a new release, and then whatever the benefits you were getting from your custom hardware were just overcome by improvements over the, the commodity hardware. So nobody really makes database machines anymore. Although you could argue in some ways, uh, uh, you know, some oracles like Exadata or Rack, you know, those are sort of custom hardware appliances or custom hardware. You could argue that those things are database machines, but nobody really uses the term anymore. The 1990s, as far as I could tell, nobody was really using custom hardware. Um, in the 2000s is when we saw uh, sort of two movements. There was the adaption or adoption of, of using FPGAs to, again, sort of do custom filtering or custom database functionality uh, in a more programmable, pro programmable hardware, uh, pushing you know, things down close to storage as possible. And then you also saw the movement towards what are called database appliances. So sort of think of these as a um, commodity hardware, but it's been, the database system has been sort of preloaded and tuned specifically to that hardware. So you could buy you know, a single one rack unit that would have Oracle or Clusterix installed, and you wouldn't have to tune any of the OS or, or kernel parameters. Everything was to be set up for you. These also sort of fell through the wayside uh, since a Amazon now, you know, you know, everybody has to be able to run with EC2. And then now in the 2010s, I think the two major movements we're seeing are still FPGAs are still interesting. People are still applying them and using them in, again, to, to speed things up. But now we're ending the era where GPU-based databases are becoming more prominent. And again, the same idea. We want to offload uh, you know, computationally expensive uh, operations that would normally execute on the CPU. We want to run it down on the GPU. So I'll talk a little about, about that uh, today. Um, we're going to spend most of our time talking about non-volatile memory, because this is something I, I have done a lot of research in the last couple of years over, uh, on. And I could talk uh, exhaustively about this. Um, but I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the end of how to use GPUs to speed up the data systems, and then just a little bit about how hardware transactional memory can be applied in the context of uh, transactional workloads to speed things up. All right, so the non-volatile memory is a not a new idea. Um, people have been sort of thinking about this since the late 1980s. The basic idea, the way to think about it, is that it's to the database system, it's going to look like DRAM. It's going to have roughly the same read and write speed or latency of DRAM. But it's going to have the ability to uh, persist all its rights and, ma and maintain durability for all the rights, even if you lose power like an SSD. Right? So the, the big distinction we saw in SSDs versus, versus DRAM, right? DRAM is super fast, um, and you can be byte addressable. You can do you know, <laughs> loads and stores into cache lines. Um, but again, you pull the power, you lose everything. And SSD, they have much larger capacities, but and they'll, they'll be slower and have this block-oriented device. So with NVM, it's going to be sort of the best of both worlds in some ways. It's going to, it's going to look and smell like DRAM, but if you pull the power, everything is going to uh, be persistent. So the first devices that are actually available today, we actually have one or two of them at, here at CMU. Uh, these will be block addressable. And so you have used this protocol called MVME, which I realize is sort of an overloaded term and maybe confusing. Uh, but the MVME is basically allows you to do kernel bypass to do reads and writes to blocks to MVM devices store, uh, that are running on the PCI Express bus. The later ones that are coming out, I gotta be careful here, because I don't want to bleep everything. Uh, all right, so I would say up front. So I know a lot of things that I can't tell you, and because I'm under NDA, so I'll be very, very careful not to say anything that I shouldn't, and so I don't get sued. Okay, so some point the later devices will come out this year or next year, this year, and then uh, they'll be byte addressable. So it's going to look, from your application standpoint, it's going to look like DRAM, but there'll be some special stuff you can do to make sure that if you uh, write something to it, you can make you know that if you come back after a restart, everything's still there. So the history of how we got to this point, actually, I think is quite fascinating. So this idea, again, of non-volatile non memory is old. And people have been sort of dreamed about or have, have used battery backed up DRAM since the 1980s. But it's really now that we're having uh, storage devices that are based on new storage mediums 
that don't require batteries that are tr truly passive circuits. So the, the history of, of how this was found, I think, is actually really fascinating. So I'm not an electrical engineer, um, but if you've ever taken an electrical engineering course, they sort of start off with the fundamentals of, of the basic circuits, uh, the kind of circuits you can have. And then you start off with the first one, which is a capacitor, and this was found, you know, uh, this was identified back in the 1700s, right? And this is the basic idea that you can change the, um, a capacitor is basically just a battery. You can put a charge in there and then, and then offload it later on. And then in the 1800s, they found, uh, they came across with a resistor. And again, the idea here is that you put a charge in and then you can, you can change the resistance, uh, or you can set a resistance and have a different charge or voltage coming out. And then the last one is an inductor found in the 1800s. And this thing, think of this as a heating coil, right? You put voltage in, and then the, these, these things can offload the energy and generate heat. So again, if you take a basic electrical engineering course uh, up until recently, they would describe it, the circuits in terms of these three terms. So now, what happened was in the 1970s, there was this guy named Leon Chua, who was a brand new professor in electrical engineering at, uh, at Berkeley. And he worked out the math, and he figured out that there had to be a fourth element, so that the, the, the equations wouldn't, wouldn't be perfectly balanced if, there, if, you, if, if you just took the three elements. But if you add this fourth elemental circuit, then everything actually works out correctly. And what he hypothesized was that this other new passive circuit would be this two-terminal device that would have its resistance change based on the uh, what voltage you apply to it. But then when you when you stop applying that voltage, it would that whatever you set its, its resistance to would persist, even if you didn't keep giving it power, right? These are passive circuits that don't require to have continuous power go going into it. So the idea is that you would have this special resistor that can remember whatever it was its, its, its last resistive state was. And so he ended up calling this the mem resistor, right? And so it sort of fits in like this. And the reason why he, he, he would argue that this was a, had to be the fourth missing fundamental circuit is that you couldn't build this element from these other three primitives, right? It had to be its own atomic thing. So he wrote this paper in the 1970s. It was very mathematical. No one read it, right? Uh, and, and it sort of just, just got, went through the wayside. And I'm sure he, he kept on working on this, but like no one really you know, recognized what this thing actually was. So now you flash forward into, into the 2000s. And there was this team at HP Labs in California led by this, uh, this researcher, Stanley Williams. And they were trying to build these sort of self-assembling nano devices in the lab. Um, and what they found was that they, they kept coming across this, these, these, when they did the experiments on these devices, they would see these weird measurements, or, or these devices would have these weird properties that they couldn't understand. And by pure luck, they basically try to find as much literature as they could on sort of different devices that, that, that exhibit this property. And then they stumbled upon Leon Chua's paper from 1971. And then that's when they realized what they actually had developed was, was the, the missing memristor, right? And then they got in touch with him and, and then they had this big kumbaya moment and they realized, okay, th we actually figured this out. So there's a great paper called uh, How We Found the Missing Memristor from 2008. And then there's a, there's a subsequent uh, uh, there's a subsequent paper in Nature published I think right around the same time where they actually went back into like the annals of scientific literature and they found all these 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 publications where other scientists from you know decades ago would report these weird uh, findings in these devices when they applied electrical charges to them and they would have the same hysteresis loop. Uh, uh, graphs that, that exhibiting all the same behavior. And then they, what they basically found was like everybody else was, it was inventing memristors back, you know, going back to like 1920s, 1930s, but nobody knew what, what it actually was. Everyone just reported, hey, we, had, we found this interesting phenomenon. We don't understand it. Here's the graph. But again, and if, if you actually chart to see what they actually look like uh, when you apply voltage to them, you see that they have the resistive properties you'd expect in, something, in, in a memristor. So, Another confusing thing about this is that the, 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 the fourth fundamental circuit will be called a memristor. HP is, is marketing their, uh, their device 
as a memristor, but there'll be some other things we'll see in a second, like what, what Intel is putting out. It's technically a, a memristor as well, uh, but it, it's the actual storage medium it's using is something different than what HP uses. So I'll try to just clarify that. So everything I'm everything we're going to talk about here for non volatile memory, these are all technically considered memristors. HP calls their device a memristor. Okay. All right. So there's basically three uh, three core uh, technologies that people have been pushing that we that look the most promising to actually achieve a you know, commodity hardware non volatile memory that can be cheaply made, cheap in quotes. And, uh, and widely used and have all the properties we're going to want. So the, the first one is called phase change memory or, P, or PRAM. So this one is probably one of the, the oldest, oldest ones. Um, and I will say this is actually what Intel uh, is, is, has for their, uh, for their non volatile memory device, the Optane memory. And although that's under NDA, uh, I can tell you this because some dude in Korea took their device, popped it open, and put it underneath an electron microscope, and figured out that it was uh, phase change memory. So that, that I, I, I won't get sued for if I tell you. Okay, so the basic way to think about how phase change memory works is that you have this like calcinogenic uh, storage medium here. I think of this as, as like a crystal. And then what happens is like, uh, depending on what uh, kind of charge you put into it, uh, you'll change change it to be whether it's transparent or whether it's opaque, and that tells you whether you have a one or a zero. So the way to think about this is you have this access line that's going into it, and then you put a, a, a you know either a long pulse or a short pulse into it, and that'll change what, what the composition of at that sort of nanoscale of what this device is actually made of. So I, I drew a little heater here, but obviously it's not like a some of the big lighter, right? It's just, just a, a small nano wire going into it. And then based on that, that'll tell you whether you have a, a zero or one. Now, this has been actually been out for a while, like prior to Intel's announcement uh, about their Optane device uh, one or two years ago. You could buy phase change memory, um, but it's not at the, the really large capacity that you would need to actually have it be a replacement for DRAM. So you could buy small, like 120 megabyte modules of PCM and put that in, in your cell phone. But obviously, that's not going to be you know, a, a replacement for, for DRAM. One issue also too with phase change memory is that uh, this, uh, you know, applying this voltage actually generates heat. So that sort of limits how much you can pack into uh, together on, on the die. Um, and then you can also only write to this, or, you know, you can only write to a single cell so many times before it burns out. So the burnout rate for this is undisclosed. The preliminary numbers are basically saying that you can read and write to a cell uh, one order of magnitude more than you can with, with a NAND flash cell, but it's still not like DRAM or SRAM. You can basically write to a cell infinitely before it burns out. The the next one is called resistant RAM, and this is what HP uh, invented uh, when they found uh, their their device or found their, their memristor. And the way it basically works is that you have two layers of platinum, uh, and then in between that you have two layers of uh, titanium dioxide. And so titanium dioxide is the same thing in uh, white house paint or the same thing in suntan lotion. So it's like super common. Um, platinum, obviously le less so. And basically how it works is that uh, if you run the current in one direction through the, the titanium dioxide layer, that'll move a uh, electron uh, up or down between them. And then that ends up changing the resistance of the device. So again, if you have one electron at the top, you get a one. If you have a new electron at the bottom, then you read it and get a zero, right? So again, these are solid state devices. So what's actually really cool about the memristor, and again, for, you know, this is why I drank the Kool-Aid when they announced this in 2008. I was like, man, this sounds awesome. This totally sounds like you know, the future of computing. Um, they talked about how the, the storage fabric for a memristor could be configured to be either actually used for storage, like storing ones and zeros, or you could convert it to be executable logic gates like an FPGA. So the idea is that you could then have like your, your memristor sitting in your DIMM slot. Half of it could be actually storing your database. The other half could be whatever you want, like doing predicates or doing, building an index inside of it. And actually, you can have code you can actually execute on the memristor. 
and they were talking about how they were building like a neural processor or something on, on a memory store. But this is, at this point, this is a decade ago, and I, I, don't, I don't know what, what's happened with this. But what's, what's even, even cooler about all this is that the, the way you actually uh, program the storage fabric is not through like the standard NAN logic gates that we use in, in the CMOSs of, of our existing computers. You actually use a different type of logic called material implication, which was invented by Bertrand Russell from like 1921, right? It's just a, a just different way of, of expressing logic in, in your program. And obviously, Bertrand Russell did this before uh, you know computers actually existed. Um, but it's just showing his, you know, his his mathematical principles can be applied from over a century ago to 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 modern hardware. So as far as I can tell, I looked last night. Uh, I'm not sure whether HP actually released anything. They seem to have a website that claims that there's something there, but it's not like you can buy it yet. Um, HP has always been very disappointing for this because. It's whatever, you know, when they announced it in 2008, they claimed everyone would have memristors in two years. Two years later, everyone said it's two more years later. And then it's always been perpetually two years later. So as of 2018, it still looks like it's two years away between, before everyone else can have it. So memristors have also the same problem as uh, the phase change memory. You can only write it to, write to it uh, so many times. And then the, the latency for this is a little bit better than phase change memory. Um, but it's still not as fast as, uh, as DRAM. The last one is much farther away, but this is the one that's probably, uh, when this happens, this, this will be a big, big deal. Um, and this could actually be a true replacement for uh, DRAM. Whereas I think for phase change memory and, and the resistive RAM from HP, those will sort of be a, an additional layer of storage between DRAM and, uh, and your SSD. Whereas with a... Uh, with, with the magnetic resistor RAM or Spintronics, these are reported to have a super, super small scale and have the same speeds of almost like SRAM. So SRAM is like your L1, L2, L3 cache. You're going even faster than DRAM and you could have you know, the capacity the size of, uh, of, of, a, of an SSD. So this would be fantastic if this actually happens. So what makes this actually different is that it's going to measure the, uh, the, 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 it's going to use magnets to figure out what the, what, whether there's a one or a zero, rather than flipping the resistance of the, of, of, of you know, of, of the actual device itself. So Samsung is probably the, one of the biggest people in this area, uh, but this is probably, I've had to guess, 10 years away, right? Um, whereas phase change memory is out now, and supposedly, um, uh, the resistant RAM from HP is, is out soon as well. So if I told you that, that, that if I just said, oh, but people have been thinking about non-volatile memory for a while, why am I so uh, optimistic about this is actually happening for real? Other than my student has been doing research in this area and he's graduating and we're kicking him out the door. Like, Why, why do I actually think this is actually happening for real and this is actually something that... Uh, we as database developers need to start taking in consideration? Well, the answer is because there's actually been three uh, major changes in the last two years uh, that, that you need to actually have in place in order for you to actually support non-volatile memory, true non-volatile memory in, in your database system. So the first has sort of been obvious is that the, uh, the major players in the industry have all gotten together and they now they have a standardized what the, what the form factor is for these different devices and how they're actually going to talk to, 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 to the motherboards. Right? So now they, they, they've codified what, how, how you'd actually build a non volatile memory device, what, what the DIMM slot's going to look like, and how you actually communicate it with the, the rest of the hardware. Linux and Microsoft has also added support for MVM in their kernels. Uh, this happened within the, the last one or two years. Um, so this sometimes is called DAX, Direct Access uh, Storage. Um, Again, this is now adding the ability for the operating system to, to recognize, oh, I have this new hardware that is, that is actually persistent, uh, has persistent memory, and, and I need to do something to it. And then I can expose it to the application, which is us as the database system, and have the application know that it's dealing with non-volatile memory or persistent memory, not just, you know, it looks like DRAM, but it has this sort of extra, you know, extra ability. 
And then the last piece is super, super important, is that Intel added in uh, early 2017, they added the new instructions to the x86 instruction set that allow you to do cache line flushes to MVM. So we'll see this in a second, but the big issue is that from the programmer standpoint, from the application standpoint, we do loads and stores into memory, and they'll, you know, they'll land in our CPU caches that we don't have any control over, right? So we could do a write to memory, and it would land in our, and we want that to be persistent, and it would land in our CPU cache, and we have no way of doing a flush to that, to that memory, um, and to know that it's actually been made it out to MVM, so we, we can be guaranteed that our transaction or whatever change we just made is actually durable. So Intel added the CL flush, cache line flush, and cache line write back instructions to allow us to have full control in our application, in our database system, to do writes and have them get written out to MVM. And we can block and essentially do an S fence and block and make sure that we don't return control to our thread until we know it's been written out. So the combination of these three, 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 these three things are actually is what you need to actually have MVM actually be useful. So to give you a little bit about uh, some background of what MV DIMMs are going to look like. So again, the idea is that, as I said, the first devices that are available now, the Intel Optane, is basically a PCI Express card that uh, has the non-volatile memory storage. But then they take that storage, and now they're going to put it into a DIMM form factor. And because of the changes to the kernel and because of the instructions, we can now do reads and writes to locations in memory and, be, and know that we're actually doing something uh, right into persistent memory. So the First three devices have been around for a while, uh, but again, you need to be paired up with the kernel to actually support this. So the first form factor is called NVDIMF, and basically this is just a DIM card with a, you know, a, a you know, DIM stick that fits into the DRAM slot, but everything's just flash. And you have to be paired up with DRAM in order to buffer your writes, uh, which then get later flushed into uh, the, the flash. The next, uh, the next iteration is called the MVDIMM, and this is when you have the flash and DRAM together on a single DIM stick, and it just appears to the operating system as, as volatile memory. So it just looks like you have an expanded address space, and the hardware itself is, is responsible for managing the flushes to writes to, out to the SSD. But the one that matters the most to us is called MVDIMP, and this is the true persistent memory using either phase change memory, resistive RAM, or spintronics where the, the operating system knows that it's actually non-volatile, knows that it's persistent, and there's no DRAM or flash on the actual, the actual DIMM stick itself. So now given this, how do we actually, how can we use this in, in, our, in our system? So the, uh, there's currently going to be three ways you can configure your application or your database system to use MVM. So the first is that you can use DRAM as just a hardware managed cache. So the in this case here, we have our address space for, the, for our database system, and when, when we do a write to a block or to a, to a page, it'll go through the virtual memory subsystem and then get written out to a physical location in DRAM, but the, uh, the DRAM is essentially acting as a buffer to MVM, and the MVM is, is what is, the size of the MVM uh, storage here is what gets exposed to the operating system as, uh, as the amount of memory that you have, and then underneath the cover is the, the, the hardware is responsible for moving things down here and, and back. Yes? What you be doing in DRAM if like, it really comes true and we have like, special instruction sets for DRAM? So this question is, why would you still need DRAM in this case here if MVM is persistent and uh, we have special instructions to actually do this? So what I'm showing here is that you, this, these, these are different ways you could use MVM in your database system. So in this case here, you could just, you, you're treating MVM as, no, as volatile memory, right? It's just a larger capacity. So again, so say this is one gig, the MVM could be 10 gigs. So the operating system is gonna see that it has 10 gigs of memory, even though it really only has one, it's just been, it's been backed by this. Right, because DRAM is going to be faster than than MVM, so you can absorb your writes, read and writes to this much faster. The MVM, even if it comes to you, it's still like slower than. So this question is: Is MVM going to be still slower than DRAM? For phase change memory and and the resistive RAM, yes. I can't say numbers, but yes, Spintronics will supposedly be faster than DRAM. All right, the next way to do this is to have just MVM next to DRAM. 
And again, so now when I do a write, I'll go directly from my address space for my, for my database system, and I can write directly either to a, a page in DRAM or page in MVM. So for this to work, the operating system will expose uh, information about the regions of memory so that you can know that here's some block of memory that, I, that I'm writing out to, and it's going to DRAM, and I know that it's not going to be persistent. So I could use this for like a temporary buffer if I'm doing a sorting, or my hash table if I'm doing a join. And then here's MVM where I could write out my log, because I know this is durable, right? So again, you have application, the data system have complete control over what region of memory it writes to, and then it can be guaranteed whatever properties the hardware provides. The last one could be a, going back to some more traditional side style of, uh, of MVM, and this is where you basically can have uh, the database system use a buffer pool in, in a traditional sense in a disk-oriented system and read-write to a disk-based file system, or it can use an MVM-based file system, bypass the buffer pool, by, bypass the kernel in some cases, and just have everything write to this. So in this case here, MVM is the only persistent area, and DRAM is volatile. In this case here, we have the buffer pool, it's volatile, but then we have two regions of persistent memory. And another thing that could happen too, I'm not showing the line here, but you could have the move data back and forth between the two layers in, in this case here. Right? You may, like, if, if you have a buffer pool miss and you need to fetch a page, you could fetch it in and maybe move it to the non volatile memory file system first and then go fetch that into the to memory that way. So again, these are just showing you that uh, MVM is just, you know, it's not just magically just persistent memory. There's a bunch of different ways that you can be able to configure through the application. The operating system will expose these knobs to you, and then we can design our different database systems to, to use either any, any one of these configurations. I suspect that what will happen is uh, this one will probably be the most common when, when the MVM actually comes out for the, at first because it's going to be a major software change to make it use either of these, one of these configurations. So the, the main takeaway, again, from a database system pr pr perspective, if it's the PCI Express bus device and it's just block-oriented, it's not that interesting because it's just going to look like a faster SSD. But when we actually have byte addressable NVM, when we can go grab single tuples doing loads and stores, uh, then that actually is going to be a game changer for us because we have to rethink how we, we built our entire system. So I can't prove this. This is always conjecture of mine. But I suspect that the in-memory database systems, right, you know, not just our own, but the other systems like MemSQL that are out there that are hyper that are in memory, that these guys will be better positioned to use true non volatile memory when it comes out because the architecture is already inherently based on accessing single tubers through, through pointers, right? It doesn't have this whole block, block ma management or page management in the buffer pool, right? All that can get thrown away if you can go access, you know, single tuples um, from MVM, which is essentially what in-memory databases do. So I know this, I can't say who, but it, if you think about it, you know, it's no surprising. But there's pretty much every single database, major database vendor that's still actively working their system is in, is, is in the process of building specialized engines that are designed for MVM rather than taking their existing block-based storage engine and trying to refactor it and have it use MVM, they're starting from scratch and writing everything, uh, they're writing a brand new system for this, right? And you can sort of think of it like as, as we saw this in the case of Microsoft Hecaton or MySQL or MongoDB, where you can drop in different execution engines, but maintain the still front end, the front end layer. Uh, that's essentially what they're trying to do for M MVM. All right, so the paper I had you guys read was a specific um, implementation of a storage engine that leverages MVM in, in an interesting way. Um, but the precursor to that paper was another one that my student and I wrote. Uh, on evaluating all the different sort of types of database system architectures you could have and how do you actually uh, uh, retro, uh, refactor them or, or reinvent them to use MVM correctly in, in, the, in the way that, that I just talked about. So the, we'll go through an example of how we're going to do this for, for all the different types of storage architectures you can, you can have in a database system, but then one of them will be equivalent to the right-behind logging stuff that you guys read in, in that paper. So for this... This paper here from our Sigma, Sigma 2015 
This was based on a system we were calling nStore, right? Because I had already done hStore, eStore, sStore. So we were doing nStore. Um, this ended up being the initial prototype of what eventually became Peloton, right? We, I decided to call, stop calling everything store, and then we sort of rewrote the system and merged it into Postgres. And so Peloton came out of this, the, the, the nStore project. So there are some, um, some things we need to have, again, to, to make sure we can use MMM correctly in, in our storage engine. So I've already talked about this one in the, in the beginning, um, but we, if we just do load loads and stores into to, to, to memory, right, traditionally this would always land in our CPU caches, and then we don't know when the operating system actually writes them out, so we can't assume that anything we write to MVM would actually be truly durable. So this is why Intel added the, the new cache line flush instructions to allow you to say, take this cache line and block me until I, you know that it's actually made it truly, you know, truly at the MVM. So the way this basically works at a high level is that you have your database system here and it wants to do some store, say it wants to do a flush for a transaction. So you do your store operation and it's always going to land in your CPU caches first. And then you use the cache line write back instruction and that will then flush it out to the, the memory controller. And so the, all the new Intel motherboards in order to support non-multiple memory basically have a little capacitor here on the, on the memory controller that can make sure that if, you, if, you, if the power gets cut, you have enough energy to write everything out to MVM. So once you do the cache line write back and it lands on the memory controller, that's enough for it, it to be considered actually durable. Right? And so this, in this case here, you're, you're, you, would, you would return control back to, to, to the application thread. But then what will happen is it's going to use this process called asynchronous data refresh, and the memory controller at some point will write your data actually out to M MVM here. And again, the capacitor has enough juice to say, if I, if I, get, if I lose power, I can just make sure I, I flush everything out. And we're talking about you know, on, the, on the nanosecond scale for, for doing this. So again, this is enough to make sure that we can do writes and everything will be durable even if we lose power. The next thing we're going to need in our system is to, do, uh, to make sure that all our pointers internally to our own data structures will be uh, consistent if we restart. So the way to think about this is like if, I, if I'm running my database system and I have internal pointers from the index to some location in the table heap for these tuples, I want to be able to have uh, the system crash and restart and have all of these pointers actually still be valid. Right? I sort of want to take what's out in NVM and bring it back into my address space for my for my process, and have those those you know virtual pointers actually be you know still correct. When if I update my version chain, and I have a new tuple. I want to make sure that if everything gets blown away, I come back and all my pointers still point to everything, right? Because traditionally there's no guarantee to do that. So to make this work, we ended up having to write our own uh, our own variant of malloc that provided these ability to do these flushes and, the, and this, this naming convention. And then this is, we could build on top of this and, and generate what we call non-volatile memory pointers that will guarantee that, again, it has all these properties. We, if we flush everything, we don't lose anything. And if we restart our process and suck in back our, our, our chunks of memory, our pointers are still pointing to the correct locations. So back in 2014 when we did this, there wasn't any libraries out there that, that, was, that, that could do this for us. And, and that's what we had to roll our own. Now there is actually a great library, and I should have put a link here, uh, from Intel called the PMDK, the Persistent Memory Data Kit. It used to be called pmem.io or libpmem. Um, and think of this as like the SDL, but for non-volatile memory. Right? They have containers, they have, uh, they, they have uh, uh, memory allocation. You could use that in your application and guarantee, then get all these things for you for free. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to build, build on top of this mem memory allocator. We want to look at the, the three canonical uh, database engine architectures you can have and how can we adapt them to use non-volatile memory. So the first one, we're going to do in-place updates. So none of this is with MVCC, although the, the right behind logging paper you read it relies on MVCC. And the way this one basically works is that you're going to have a table heap plus a log plus snapshots. Like this is the standard in-memory database architecture for uh, transactional uh, systems that we, we've been talking about so far. 
Um, and the example architecture we're using, basing this on, is, is VoltDB or HDAR. The next one you can have is a copy and write architecture, where you have a, a tree hierarchy, and any time that a transaction updates a page, you make a copy of it, apply order to changes, and when that transaction commits, you flip a master record pointer to point to the new version of the tree. And this is equivalent to uh, for LMDB, the Lightning, the Lightning Memory Map Database System. And the last one is a log structure architecture. And again, this is where you have no table heap and only a log. Uh, and this is based on like level D or RocksDB. So the way to think about this is, this one you have a heap and a log. This one has, you only have the heap. And this one you only have the log. So I'll go through real quickly with this. So let's focus on the, the end memory update one. So this is how it works normally in our in memory system that we talked about so far, right? You have, a, you have an index, it points to tuples in the table heap, and then when you make changes, you write things out to the write-ahead log, and then occasionally you, you take snapshots. So the issue with this is that if I update a single tuple, we end up uh, making three writes to memory, or non-volatile memory, for this single update. So assume everything fits in non-volatile memory. When I update this tuple, I'm going to put out a, a log record in the write-ahead log, I'm going to make my change into the table heap, and then eventually I'm going to, uh, up, you know, take a snapshot and write the checkpoint out to, to, you know, to a, to a file there. So if we assume there's no DRAM, that all of this is just sitting in MVM, then we are essentially making three copies of the same change, right? And as I said, the this this duplicate data is problematic is because uh, you can't write to these cells an infinite number of times. So for a single update, you're making three, three changes, you could burn out the device very quickly. It's also problematic for the recovery latency because now when I want to recover my database system, I got to load in the last checkpoint uh, and then replay the log in, in order to stall the change. Where in actuality, as long as I, if I'm careful about how I do my transactions and my updates, I could just come back and recognize that, oh, that my heap is persistent this is all the data I actually need to recover the database. Maybe I look at the log and try to figure out uh, you know, what, what changes should be rolled back because they haven't committed before I crashed. But I don't need to load the, the, the last snapshot, and I certainly probably don't need to replay the entire log. So the idea here is that we can come up with an optimized architecture where we can leverage the fact that we have non volatile memory pointers that can point to the record that changed rather than how it changed and then when we, when we crash and come back, we just go to see what were transactions, what transactions were active at the moment of, of the crash and undo any of the changes that they had. Right? This is essentially the, the main technique that is being applied to write, a, write behind logging in the paper you read. Right? We, we only end up logging pointer or metadata about what was changed rather than how it changed. And this is different than write-ahead logging where you record the delta or record the tuple of what was modified and then in, reinstall it when you come back. Right, so the, the log here is just a way for us to figure out, to find the thing we know that should be uh, rectified upon recovery. So if we go back to our architecture here, if we make this now be MVM aware, we get rid of the snapshots entirely because we don't need them because our table heap has everything we need. And then when we make a change, we just write in our redhead log a pointer to this thing that says, here's what was modified, and then we, we can go apply, apply our change. Now, in the case of right behind logging, there's some extra stuff that we're recording uh, to keep track of what are the actual transactions at, that, at, 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 at every, every step. And that way, we know the timestamp range or what things should be visible when we come back, because it's a multi-version environment. So the idea is there, you're using those timestamps to figure out, figure out how to do cooperative garbage collection to prune things out that shouldn't be there. In this case here, because we're doing in-place updates, uh, we just need to know that this thing is actually the correct version we should have. All right, next is to do copy and write engine. And again, this is where we only have a table heap. We don't have any, we don't have any log. So the issue with this is that if you have sort of a page-oriented architecture, like in, a, in, in sort of LMDB, then any time you update a single tuple, you have to make a copy of the entire page for it, uh, and then apply your change. And then update the dirty directory to say here's here's a go you know here's what the the new version of the tree to look like, and then you do a pointer swap at the top to now have the master record point to this. So anytime you update a single tuple, you're copying the entire page in order to make that change because otherwise this dirty directory or the directory of of what changes you make would be massive. 
right? So, so sort of taking a, a block-oriented approach to amortize the cost of keeping track of these pointers. So the issue is that these, these, these copies get really expensive. Again, to make a single change, you, up to, you have to copy a whole page for this. So the way to speed this up is that you, in, in a non-volatile memory environment, is that instead of having, again, pages for your tuples, you just have pointers. Because you're going to have a tree structure anyway. So now we can just basically build a B plus tree where the tuples are stored in the leaf pages. And the dirty directory is just, again, another node in the tree. And again, it's, it's more fine grained. So now we don't have to do expensive copies every single time we, we make an update. Again, we can do this because we're NVM, right? And we know everything's going to be byte addressable. We can always get to a single tuple. The last one is to do a log structured engine, right? And this is a high level, this is how LevelDB or, or RocksDB works. Right? You have the in-memory data structure, your mem table, where you have some index, and then a write-ahead log where you apply your changes. And then over time, you, 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 you take the contents of the, MT, of the mem table, and then you write it out to the, the sorted string table, the SS table. So when I want to do an update, I find my entry in the index, I apply my, my, my tuple delta, and then at some later point, I'll do uh, I'll copy this thing out to my SS table and apply all, all my changes in there. So the uh, just like with the the in place engine, you're you're paying this penalty because you have all this, these these copied extra copies of the data. Um, when everything could just fit in NVM, then you don't need to actually make the second copy because this thing's already been persistent, right? In RocksDB now. They assume that this is volatile, so that's why they write it out this thing to the SS table. But if, you, if this is now non-volatile, then you don't need to make the second copy. So you can get rid of this du duplicate data, and you can also get rid of compactions entirely, because you just take this and you put it aside, uh, and that's enough to actually you know, still find the data and not worry about uh, generating these long, long runs. So essentially what you do is just get rid of this entirely. And then now you only have the mem table, right? And that's enough to actually make sure everything's persistent and get the same performance. Yes? Does it mean we don't have to do anything? Like when we move to MVM, if we are not using MVCC? Uh, your question is um, yeah, if, we're not using if, we're, if we're not using MVCC, does it mean we, we, we don't have to do anything when we move to MVM because we don't need logging and like So, I, I'm not sure what you're asking. If, if you're using MVCC, you're not using if you're not using MVCC, what do you mean? And things we are using like MVM, so we don't have to do like we don't have to deal with additional stuff due to like DRT mocking or like the country or. So you're talking, you're talking about the in-place engine. Yeah. All right, go back to this. So you're saying if you're doing in-place updates, you don't have to do. Yeah, you, we, we don't expect. Yeah, that's what this is. What are you saying? That you don't have to do anything different? You don't have to do like any logging. And... So you, you like, yeah. In this example here, because because if you make sure that that the transactions changes are can be applied and, and committed, uh, then when you come back, this this thing is guaranteed to be consistent. Yeah, so it doesn't make sense for us to do logging. The logging in this, so the, so the issue is though is that um, for this one here, what happens? Uh, if you, you do need some undue information somewhere to be able to, to, if you overwrite this directly and if the transaction hasn't committed yet, you need to be able to make sure you can undo it. MVCC, that's easy because you, if you always have the older versions around. Let's, let's take a look offline. Let's keep going because we're short on the time. Okay, so the the main takeaway I want to get you guys from out of this is that with non-volatile memory, uh, the key thing that's going to be is if we know that we're operating on non-volatile memory, then we can end up devising uh, storage architectures that can reduce the amount of data you have to write because you know that you're, you could be writing to memory that is actually persistent, so you don't have to make a separate copy or put things into a block and flush it out to something else. You can design the system to say, I know that I can write to this region of memory, 
and therefore it's going to be persistent. And that's enough to make sure that if I crash to come back, everything will be there. So for some things, the reason why I don't think DRAM is going to go away, because there'll be some things where you actually want a volatile buffer because you don't care. Like if I'm doing a, a hash join, who cares if I crash in the middle of the query and my hash table gets wiped out, right? And that'll also reduce the number, the, the number of writes and wear down I'm doing to my storage device. So I think that the, the future is going to be you're going to have DRAM uh, and, and MVM together, and you can have the MVM actually be the... Uh, you know, the, 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 the source location of the entire database, but then you can have DRAM actually be, you know, for hot data and also for temporary data structures. And that's probably the best way to get, get full, the, the, the best performance out of this, this hardware. And then as we said, there, there's essentially these, M, for these recovery optimizations, we can actually load the system much faster uh, if we're just dealing with pointers to make sure that everything's consistent rather than... Um, you know, rather than have to replay the log, right? And that was the big thing out of the right ahead, right behind, right behind logging paper. Okay. So the next area we want to talk about is GPUs. So again, GPUs have been around for for you know obviously a, a while, um, but it's you know, up until very 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 recently, people have only applied them for graphics, right? Uh, but now with the advent of like Bitcoin mining or, or deep learning, people are looking at how you can, you can apply these, these highly parallel uh, GPU architectures for, for other types of computation. So probably within the last decade or so, people have looked at using GPUs for accelerating the, the execution of analytical queries. So GPUs have a lot of cores, right? Think of like thousands of cores compared to like you know, maybe a couple dozen cores on a single socket uh, on, on Intel Xeon. But these cores are much more simple than the Xeons, uh, so you can't actually have them do, you know, really complicated, complicated instructions. So you can have them do repetitive operations that are relatively simple to what the CPU can actually support, you may be able to, be able to boost performance of your system. So the kind of things we're going to want to target on our GPUs or anything that does not require any blocking and doesn't require any branches or conditionals as you actually do your execution. So the best possible scenario would be to do a sequential scan with, 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 a, with a filter because you can have every, every single core, you know, a thousand cores, all operate on different streams of data and each apply the same filter and they don't need to communicate with each other or you know, have an if branch that go down some, some, you know, some path of code versus another. You sort of stream the data in and you're running at almost bare metal speed. So obviously what would be bad for this is a B plus tree, an off the shelf B plus tree that's doing index pros because you're going grabbing a single tuple, it's hard to parallelize that across a thousand cores, right? The, now there, there is one, I've seen a couple of papers that have devised B plus trees to, that can run on GPUs, but again, you wouldn't want to do transactions on these. So the key thing to understand how GPUs are going to work and how they're going to fit into our, our database system hierarchy or architecture is that GPUs have their own memory that is super, super fast, but it's not cache coherent with the CPU's memory. Now, I say usually because AMD has this thing called the APU, and I think Intel recently announced that they have a uh, sort of graphics uh, uh, GPU like accelerator appearing on the same socket. I don't know whether it's cache coherent. So you basically have a big pool of memory for your for your CPU, and that's where your database is, and then a, a, a large but not as big pool of memory for your for, on your GPUs. And the big cost is going to be moving the data back and forth between the two of them. So the way to sort of think about it is like this: so you have your, your CPU that has DRAM, and then this will be the primary storage location of, of your of your database. And then somewhere else on your host machine, you'll have a, bu a bunch of GPUs. And so uh, the way to think about these GPUs is just, again, just a bunch of smaller cores with their own memory that are programmable. So the way to sort of think about how you want to devise your system and how you can actually use this uh, is going to, in many ways, is going to be limited by the speed in which you can get data from the CPU down to the GPUs. So roughly speaking, for DDR4, going between the CPU and DRAM is around 40, 40 uh, you know, gigabytes a second. But going over the PCI Express bus, 
from the CPU to the GPU is around 16 gig, uh, gigabytes per second, right? So this is a significant bottleneck, right? We can process the data much more quickly over, over here. Um, so the benefit we would get from having all these extra cores might be negated by the fact that we can't get our data down there. Now, we'll see this in the next slide, but there are some database systems that have proposed where basically you can dump the entire database on your GPUs and all your queries run down there, right? And everything ends up just being a sequential scan because you can't, you can't build an index down here and every single core is gonna just scan some segment of the, of the database or the table in your query and produce your answers that way. And of course, this limits you to, to the amount of memory that, you're, that you have in your GPUs. So now you can uh, chain these guys together or link them together. So NVIDIA has something called M MVLink that allows you to have a 25 gigabyte uh, connection between, the, uh, between the, the two GPUs. And actually you can get the same connection to the CPUs on some architectures. So as far as I, can, as far as I know, you can use MVLink on Intel, but IBM on Power 8, Power, Power 9 allows the, provides the MVLink capabilities that allow your GPUs to actually access uh, access memory up, up in the CPU. But I, I actually don't know whether it's cache coherent. So there's three basic ways you can architect a database system to use GPUs. So I'm showing here is a bunch of different database systems that are out there and they all, they all do different things. Um, but they're mostly moving towards this, this, this last, last model here. So as I said, the easiest way to have use GPUs in your database system is just take your entire database and then stick it down onto your, your GPUs every single query will run entirely on the GPU. And then it spits out the answer back to the, the CPU uh, that you then send back to the client. And of course, this means that any time that you, you update the database, you have to uh, either un unload the thing and bring it back in or run an expensive uh, you know, merge operation to apply your changes to, to the, the, the data that's resident on the, on the GPU. So for this case here, all the queries can do basically mass massively parallel sequential scans just crunch the data uh, as fast as possible. And some of the numbers they get are actually quite ridiculous. Um, so I think that there's algorithms to do uh, basically every single relational operator you, you could want, like hash joins, sorting, uh, scans, obviously, aggregations, all of those things could be implemented on, on a GPU. The another approach is sort of take a, a hybrid uh, storage approach where you're gonna put just the most important columns you have on your database put them down on your GPU, and then you retain the rest of your database up in, in CPU's memory. And then whenever you have a query come along, you're going to uh, figure out at first what portion of the query can I execute down on the GPU. And hopefully that cuts out most of the crap you don't actually need to look at for your, for your query. And then the GPU spits back out offsets for the tuples that, that satisfy the predicates that were ran on, on the GPU resident data. And then you just use the CPU code now to get, go do your lookup and memory, find the remaining records that matched, and then do whatever additional filtering or, or processing on them. And the idea here is that, again, the GPUs have, uh, I think the most, you know, maybe you know, 100 gigs of, D, of, of memory, whereas the CPU can, can, can have terabytes. Um, and the idea here is that you just want to use the, the, the memory on the GPU in a more intelligent way so that you don't try to put everything on there, so, but you still get some of the benefit of GPU processing. The last one that is probably becoming more common is that the database always resides in the, the CPU memory or even out on disk, and then you have these streaming algorithms that can stream data down into the GPUs over the PCI Express bus or the MD link, do all your processing, and then spit back results to, to the CPU. And the, the tricky thing about this is that you, have to, you want to orchestrate it so that the the, the GPUs are never starved waiting for data. Like you're always just streaming data as fast as possible from the CPU down to the, the GPUs. They're crunching on it and producing results. And then by the time they finish processing the first batch, uh, the, the next batch is all ready to go for them to process. Right? This, this takes careful engineering to actually make this work. But again, uh, as far as I know, all relational operator algorithms can be implemented in this fashion. This is, again, is a quick, quick pitch for those of, you, those of you that are coming back in, in the fall, uh, we're gonna have our seminar series on Harbor Accelerator databases uh, on Thursdays, um, starting in, in, I think, the first week of September. And all of these companies listed here, um, still waiting, actually, 
these guys don't respond to my email, and I'm waiting to confirm with them, but all the other ones are, are and a few other are, are coming to this, this, this Harvard series, or this seminar series. So again, this is probably more common. These are all startups. Uh, Bright Light is actually based on Postgres, but as far as I know, all the other ones are based on new architectures. Uh, and it, it probably what will happen is, is that if this looks like to be a promising um, addition to have in a database system, the major database vendors will buy some of these startups and then it'll get merged into the, 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 the full systems. That's, that's usually what happens. So Oracle will have this in 10 years. <laughs> All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is hardware transactional memory. Um, so the way to think about hardware transactional memory, it's, it's, it was actually invented by uh, Maurice Herlihy, who used to be a professor here at CMU um, in the early 1990s. Uh, the same guy that invented linearizability. Um, he should get the Turing Award probably in the next five years, hopefully. Um, the, the way to sort of think about this is that the, the hardware itself is actually going to manage transactions for us. And now when I say transactions, I don't mean the, uh, so the, the, the larger logical transactions that we deal with in our database system and our current control scheme. Sort of think of these as like mini batches, like protecting critical sections in, in our code. And the idea here is that it, you, in your code, you can now define, you can tell the, the CPU, hey, I'm starting a transaction, and then you have your code do whatever it is it normally would do, and then you commit that transaction, and then the hardware figures out to see whether there was a conflict with any other thread that may have, may have read or written to the same memory regions that you read or written to, um, and if so, it'll abort you and roll you back. So at a high level, these things basically operate in the same way that optimistic concurrency goal works, is that you maintain all your reads and writes in your private workspace, and then when you go to commit, you validate with other threads that may have been touching the same regions as you have. So Intel added this in, uh, in, the, in the instruction set in, I think, 2012, and they'll call it, they'll call it TSX, or uh, Transactional Synchronization Extensions. I don't know whether this, uh, th this exists in, in, in other hardware. Um, so it first came out, they announced in 2012, you could buy chips with it in 2013, and then 2014, apparently there was a big bug in this, uh, where it wasn't actually transactional, then they turned it off, uh, and then since then, I think 2015, 2016, they turned it back on. So any Xeon you buy now will have this capability. So now one key limitation about this, and the reason why this is not gonna be a replacement for all the concurrent scale stuff that we talked about before, for our, for our transactions, or database transactions, is that the read-write set of any transaction running in this, in this environment has to fit in your L1 cache, which I think is a 32 kilobytes. And the reason is because they're actually going to piggyback off of the, uh, the cache coherency protocol that they normally use for a, a multi-core or multi-socket environment. They're going to use that to figure out whether there was actually a conflict between two, uh, two transactions in, in the system. So it means that we can't use this for general purpose transactions, but we're going to be able to use it in some, 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 some smaller scenarios for, to help us build latch-free indexes. Or, and, I, and I say latch-free in terms of um, we can still define our latches, uh, but the hardware actually won't, won't actually write to them. So there's a paper from the Hyper guys, as always, uh, in 2015, where they basically, actually this is from the, um, this is from the BW3, BW3 people. This is showing you how, how to use it in the context of indexing. There's a paper from the Hyper guys, I think it's on the, the reading list in the class, where they basically show how can you use uh, uh, Harvard transactional memory for general purpose transactions. And you basically have to break it up into mini transactions to make sure everything fits in L1 cache. And as far as I know, nobody actually ever does this because it's super complicated. So the programming model for HTM, at least in the context of uh, uh, x86 on Intel, uh, there's basically two modes. So the first one is called hardware lock elision. And basically the idea is that you, you, you declare your thread as running a tra hardware transaction, or, or transactional memory transaction, and any time you do a write to like any like critical section to like, a, to like a piece of memory, like a lock or a latch, the, uh, the, the CPU actually doesn't apply the write. So it's sort of like a Jedi mind trick. The hardware says, yeah, you wrote to it, no problem. But then anybody else tries to read that, that section uh, won't actually see your write. And then what happened is, if there's a conflict, like if two people try to write to the same location, uh, then your, your, your sort of mini transaction in the critical section will get aborted 
and then the CPU will automatically roll you back to the beginning of your critical section, and then start it over, but then now it actually takes all the latches on the, on the, the, the memory, memory uh, locations that you actually wrote to. So the first way you go through, you actually don't apply any writes, nobody sees them. If there's a conflict, you roll back and then do it all over again, and then actually take, take, take writes on, on the lodge, locks. The sort of more enhanced version of this is called restricted transactional memory. So this is the same thing as HLE, but what will happen is if you have an abort, you can actually have a callback function, like a location, a, a code path that the hardware will jump to upon abort that allow you to do something special, something different. So in this case here, the first one, it's automatic. If, you, if there's a conflict, you get rolled back and you re-execute from the beginning in the same spot again, but now you actually acquire your latches. In this case here, you can actually jump out of that and, and execute some other code. So as I said, the only way I, the only thing I think this is actually useful for, at least in its current incarnation, is to do latch elision in, in, uh, in, in trees for indexes. So we saw this before when we talked about index latching at the very beginning of the semester, right? If we want to do an, we want to do an insert into our index, like add key 25 here, we would do the speculative uh, latching approach where we take read latches all the way down and we can release them once we know that we're at, a, we're at a node in our tree that's considered safe, meaning like for error insert, we don't have to split. So then uh, we get down here and do our exclusive lock and now we do our, our insert. So this is how you would do it without this Harvard transactional memory. But with Harvard transactional memory, the program is sort of looked like this. So you have again this, this section here this would be the where you would declare it to the CPU. Here's here's my transaction, and so I go uh, my my sort of the scope of everything I'm acquiring is all in here, and again I'm saying latch and unlatch, but it's actually not going to apply that change, or you're actually not going to uh, you know try to update anything, right? If anybody else comes along and tries to look in the same thing, they'll see that everything is unlatched. Then we get to the bottom here, and we go ahead and commit our transaction, and then now uh, it can apply our update for acquiring our latch. So now it's sort of like we magically got down to the bottom without having any uh, uh, conflicts with anybody else acquiring latches at the same time. So someone could have come down and gone this way and maybe you know, update down here and not have any collision with us because uh, we went down a another branch. So it's sort of like from the outside, it looks like you started the root and then magically you jumped here to the bottom and with the correct latches and everything's still safe uh, because underneath the covers, the, C the CPU didn't actually apply your updates. So is this clear? So as I said, as far as I know, nobody actually does this in, uh, uses Howard or transaction in, in this manner. Um, or does it for any, any other part of the system? They might they might do it and in, in, they might do it and not disclose it. But I haven't seen any papers that say you know here's a commercial in memory database or a co uh, commercial disk based database that does stuff like this. There's only been research publications, even though hardware transaction memory has been out for a while. Okay, what's that? Because I think again the the. My guess would be because everything has to fit in L1. All right. Underneath the covers is basically doing OCC as well. I mean, you also think about it too, like, uh, like, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? The, you know, existing systems have this, you know, years and years and years of, of you know, B plus G code that uses latches and crabbing, things like that. To go ahead and rewrite everything to use this would be a major undertaking. That's probably why. All right. So uh, to finish up, this is mostly about non-volatile memory. But again, the, the, the non-volatile memory is actually really interesting. Non-volatile you know, non, non memory, when it comes out, could require us to rethink entirely how we build database systems. So I suspect that in five years, when non-volatile memory becomes more common, uh, for like the introduction database class, we will throw out all the crap we talk about buffer pools and, and low-level disk-based stuff. Like MVM could be just complete game change uh, for how we think we, we design our database systems. That's not to say like the disk-oriented systems will not still be around, but nobody will build a system, uh, 
you know, to targeting SSDs if NVM becomes, you know, what they claim it's, it'll be able to do, like large capacities that are super fast and durable, okay? And in case of GPUs, again, we'll, we'll this will be covered in the seminar in the fall. Uh, right now, none of the major systems, as far as I know, use it, but it, there's definitely a lot of startups in, in this area. And then hardware transactional memory is only useful for do lock of lesion in, in indexes, okay? So that's pretty much the end of lecturing for me for the end of the semester. So again, I will hand out the final exam on, uh, on, on Wednesday. It'll, it won't be too bad. Uh, and then we'll have the guest speaker from Snowflake come talk about their system. Um, and I think it's always useful because they will talk about things that uh, they'll cover basically a lot of the same things that I talk about, but it's sort of, sort of put it into the scope or the context of trying to you know, run a real system. Okay, yes? When is the final exam due back? Well, I'll make it due the, the same day as the final presentation, so May 14th. I'll, I'll, I'll put it the website. Yes? The last lecture we talked about DRAM and its non-trivial amount of energy consumption. Do you yeah. know where NVM stands relative to that? So this question is, uh, what is the en energy consumption of, of NVM? Um, so one is, like, it's, it's a passive circuit, so like, you don't have to keep refreshing it. That's not true. I can't say why. Let me turn off the video. I'll say why. And then, uh, but like, it's purported to be less, right? Certainly, if you have one terabyte of DRAM, that's going to be sucking a lot more power than one terabyte of NVMe. Yes? First, how expensive do we expect these things to be? And second, off camera. Yes, keep going. And second, uh, doesn't that just not only change the way we think of databases, but change the way we think of computer architecture? Anyway? So, his question is doesn't the, the idea of non volatile memory change not only the way we think about databases, but also the way we think about computer architecture? Absolutely. But the most important application. Is databases. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my answer. All right, any other questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a simple more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze, have escape. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold a real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off, with same odds